Good morning, New North. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us to start. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to worship you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust that you are good and faithful and that you want to teach us. I pray, God, that you would clear away distractions that would keep us from you. Um, I pray, Father, that you would um, prepare us to, ha- to receive whatever you want to teach us. And Lord, I pray that anything that is not of you that I say, well, you would just get rid of like chaff. Um, I pray, Father, that instead only your truth would be what sticks with us, Father. We put this in the hands of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Imagine for a second that I know nothing about the God of the Bible or about Jesus, and I am sitting down with you for lunch. And I ask you, hey, give me one word that explains the character of this God that you keep talking about. What is the one word you would say to me? Okay, this is the part where you guys are going to be like, oh man, I can't believe she made me do this. But turn to your neighbor and tell them what your one word would actually be. Okay, so now who's bold enough to just yell out what they they would say? Love, okay. Faithful, grace, forgiving, anything. Holy, mercy, Mercy. hopeful. Hopeful. You know, those are all wonderful things about God. They're all amazing things about God. And I think that they all speak to the unique experiences and stories that we have with him. But what if I told you that the most important word explaining the character of God was righteous? To tell you the truth, up until about a few weeks ago, I would not have said that as the first word. It would certainly wouldn't have been the first word that popped into my head. In fact, it really didn't sit that well with me. It might have been number eight or nine on my list of attributes of God, but it probably would have only made the list because cognitively I know it's true. And perhaps part of that is because righteous isn't really a word we use anymore. You know, like if I were to go up to you and say, hey, you know what? You are so righteous. You know, that wouldn't even feel like a compliment. I'd be like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Why would you say something like that? You know, we, it would almost be a dig. When we think of the word righteous now, we think of self-righteous. We think of holier than thou. And, And for a lot of us, when we think of the word righteous, images of divisiveness actually come up because when something is right, that actually means that something is wrong. And that feels abrasive, sometimes it feels exclusive, or it just feels plain mean. So the word righteous is just not something that we talk about very often. And I think if we're honest, most of us think of God's righteousness as something that you balance out with God's love. God is righteous, but don't worry, he's loving too. Based on scripture though, righteousness isn't just something that gets balanced out by the love of God. It is by itself completely wonderful. The Bible is actually thick. It's covered with this thick, rich understanding of God as righteous. And that is actually the best of things. That's what the Bible tells us. The best kings in the nation of Israel are explained as ruling with righteousness. God himself in the Psalms is explained as having righteousness as the base of his throne. Job explains how he will boast of the righteousness of his creator. Isaiah talks about a coming king who will wear righteousness like a belt. And Jesus even in his sermon on the Mount says, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. It turns out it's not just something that we should value, but it's actually something we should pursue. But why? In a world where it seems like people just want love, why does God's righteousness actually matter at all? Today in our passage in Psalm 119, our poet not only tells us how God and his laws are righteous, but he helps us to understand why that actually matters more than anything. If you have a Bible, open it to Psalm 119, and we are going to start reading at verse 137. It's a long psalm, Um, but we're going to read two stanzas. Okay, 137. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes you have laid down are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though I am lowly and despised, I do not forget your precepts. 
Your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. I call with all my heart, answer me, Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to you, save me and I will keep your statutes. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I've put my hope in your word. May I stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice in accordance to your love. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your laws. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, Lord, and all your commands are true. Long ago, I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. Now, why does it matter that God is righteous? Well, first, God's righteousness matters because we need a God we can trust. Now, over and over again through this psalm, we have this image given to us of God's word being laid down like a path. And here, the psalmist who finds himself in the middle of tremendous trial, I mean, he says he's surrounded by enemies who ignore God's word. He says he feels lowly and despised. In other words, he feels insignificant. Trouble has come upon him. He declares that still this path that God put before him is fully trustworthy. Not just trustworthy, fully trustworthy. And the promises that God's laid out in scripture, they've been thoroughly tested. God has been found to be good on his promises. And why is that? Because he's righteous. Now the word right or righteous appears a couple, bunch of times in this first stanza and can be understood as straightforward or fair, but the primary understanding of this word is actually perfection. God is perfect. And while most of us, when we think of the word perfect, have images of something along the lines of Mary Poppins in our head, God's, God's perfection is a lot more comprehensive than that. He's perfect in his essence or in who he is, but he's also perfect in his execution and what he does. And I think the psalmist here is repeating this righteousness over and over because he wants to understand that God's righteousness is active and it's consistent. You can trust him because he's righteous. You're not just being gullible or having some, a fast one pulled over on you when you trust him. Now, it's interesting now with everything from the upcoming election to all the reports that are being released and, you know, all kinds of stuff coming from the highest levels of government to the biggest companies in the world, everyone wants us to trust them. In fact, people and companies and government systems all profit off of our trust in them, don't they? I mean, none of them could actually exist without our trust in them. But we're getting pretty skeptical as a culture. I mean, another report of a company that made a mistake that, were, that broke all of the security so everybody got a bunch of information they shouldn't have. You know, another government official gets charged with perjury. Another church gets accused of wrongly handling abuse. We're kind of getting numb to the disappointment. And couple that cultural distrust with our own instances when we feel let down by people or used or just plain disappointed in someone not showing up or caring. And honestly, it gets really hard to figure out of all the people who are asking you to trust them, who is actually work worth banking your trust on. As I've gotten, my, as I've gotten older, I found myself asking, is trusting them going to make a fool out of me? Because I don't want to be gullible and I have no idea what this person's intentions are. It's comforting to know that Jesus himself was no stranger to this distrust and disappointment. And actually loving people does not mean blindly putting your trust in them. In the Gospel of John, as people started following Jesus and putting their faith in, them, in him, the Gospel writer tells us, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in the heart of every human. He didn't trust human intentions. He didn't trust us to be righteous, but he did trust God to be. Like Jesus, the psalmist knows the word of God or the way that God has set the path out for us, it's a sure thing. And even in a world that's untrustworthy, it's as if the psalmist is reminding himself before God, Lord, you know, maybe I can't trust everything else, but the path that you've set, I can stand confidently on this path knowing it is not going to fall out from under me because your path, it's righteous because it comes from a righteous God. God's intentions are pure and they're laid out in his promises. 
He's never going to make a fool of you. It's interesting how the more you obey God, specifically in the areas of your life that require sacrifice and that are really hard for you, the more you come to trust his intentions for you. I have never, not once, been disappointed to, after I've obeyed God. Not once. And, and, but trust in God's path, the kind of trust that requires sacrifice and re- requires you giving something up, it just doesn't come out of nowhere. And it's not easy. It's built. And when we first start taking steps of obedience Uh, with Jesus on the pathway that God set out, sometimes it feels like we're stepping out onto a path that looks like this. Doesn't look so trustworthy. In fact, that's a real bridge. People really use this bridge, and it's in Pakistan, which is crazy to me. Each step, if you're on a bridge like this, would feel precarious, like you're going to lose your footing, or like the peg that you're on is going to break. And it, to make matters worse, there's a second bridge that used to be the bridge right next to it, right? So you're thinking like, well, it's only a matter of time, really, okay? The psalmist here is reminding himself and us the path that we're on, it may feel like walking on something as scary as that. It may feel like that. In fact, you could be reminded over and over and over again of all the other times something else has failed you as you're deciding to trust in God. But because of his perfection, because of the righteousness of God, our steps are actually on a path that looks a lot more like this. You're, you're safer than you think. Because God is righteous and perfect, you can trust him. Does that mean that obedience always feels good in the moment? Nope. No, it doesn't. Sometimes obedience hurts and it requires us deciding, you know what, Lord, I'm going to fully trust your ways even when I don't understand them yet, because I know the promises that you have laid out have been thoroughly tested. It means, you know what, Lord, I can trust you and I can trust your ways with my marriage, even though I feel lonely. I can trust you and the way, the, your ways with my career, even though everyone else is climbing and I feel like I'm stuck. I can trust your ways with my dating life, even though your ways seem culturally irrelevant. I can trust your ways with my broken relationships in my family, even though they're painful. It's in moments like that, when we first take steps of faith towards Jesus, that God often does his deepest work in our hearts. I was talking to someone last week, and what this person said has like just repeated over and over in my head. He said, if I hadn't had my heart cut so deeply, I would never have understood the love of God. What a beautiful, albeit painful place to be. God always, always, always meets us when we choose to trust his ways. And we can trust them because he's righteous. It matters that God is righteous because we need a God we can trust. But it also matters that God is righteous because we need a God who does not change. So I moved a few weeks ago uh, back in with my parents. So I am the stereotype. I've achieved it. I'm a millennial that lives with my parents. Great. Done it. And I think over the past eight weeks, I've realized that in theory, change is awesome. All right, all these new ideas and new things change. Sounds so great and so cool. But then, like, in actuality, it's not that great, okay? It's really hard. And if I were to rate myself on a scale of from 1 to 10 on my adaptability on major life changes, I'd give myself a solid 4, maybe a 5 on a very generous day. And the hard part is, is that it's taken me a really long time to realize that I'm bad at change. So I've... I've fooled myself. I haven't fooled anybody else that I'm bad at change. But I've, I've been like, no, I'm really good. My sister a few weeks ago was like, no, you're just having a hard time because you're bad at change. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Well, it all came out during this past four weeks because my poor fiance was helping me pack. And all he had to do was ask, do you really want to bring all these books when you don't even read them? You know that rage feeling? <laughs> I like, I snapped up and I said, this is not even up for discussion. If you don't understand that I love books, you don't even know me. (laughs) And he like stood there silently for a second and looked at me and was like, okay, I'll put the books in the truck. (laughs) Books are coming. Yeah, change is hard. 
change is really hard. And the problem is change is inevitable and it's constant. Even if your routine doesn't change at all, I mean, think about it, your body changes. Even if the big parts of your life don't change, our culture changes. Even, if, even, even as the things around us change, big and small, sometimes it feels freeing, but most of the time, change feels chaotic and scary. Sometimes it's a mix of the two. Isn't it comforting to know that God is not an adapting, nor is he an improving God? Because he is righteous or perfect already, he has nothing to improve on. And this actually enables us to cling to the God that we know during changes we can't control. While we would say his word is alive and active in our lives, and he does want us to change, just as the spirit is alive and active and calling us to become more like God, God himself does not change. In Numbers, God's word tells us, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? The apostle James in his letter tells us, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. I love that. The author of the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And our psalmist in this passage is actually comforted by that too. He says, your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous. Give me understanding that I may live. Why does this matter and why is this comforting? Well, first... It means that we recognize him when we see him. One of my favorite characters from X-Men, which is weird, you'll understand in a minute. Have you ever, you know Mystique? Okay. I don't know what it says about me that I think Mystique's awesome, okay? But because she's a shapeshifter and she changes into whatever will keep her from being recognized so she can basically do whatever she wants, okay? She always escapes because she's recognized too late. God is not like that. And sometimes I think we think he is. Because he is righteous, there is nothing in him meant to trick or to beguile us. Things that are of him in our lives match the character we see of him in scripture. He's never going to tempt us away from him and he's never gonna tell us something that contradicts what what he's said already. Now, the more you know the word of God and the pathway that he's laid out, the more time you spend with him, the easier it is to recognize not only who he is, but also who he's calling you to become. Because if you know him, you know what he's asking of you. If he was a changing God and we were dependent on his whims or his emotions, we can never really be sure of who we were trying to be because we would never be sure of who he is. So it matters that God doesn't change because it means we can recognize him when we see him. But second, God not changing matters because we get to read our experiences and our cultures through his standards, not the other way around. What do I mean by that? If God is righteous and his standards do not change, then no matter how much our culture changes, then we can assume his standards are always going to be the ones we live by because they are the ones that are actually right. And honestly, I think this is a huge obstacle in our cultural moment, especially for my generation, especially in the Bay Area, because there are chasms here that separate the standards we walk in as believers and our cultural expectations. Oftentimes, because the standards we see in God's word are inconvenient, they require sacrifice. Some of the standards that you see in scripture seem exclusive or limiting, And let's face it, they're really hard. I had a conversation with a really dear friend a long time ago. Um, She's a believer. And at the time she was dating someone who wasn't a follower of Jesus. And they decided to move in together. And she was telling me about how she has a ton of peace about it. And about how their relationship and about how God was really calling her into this. And at the time I told her, you know, I get it. Like, I get how much that sounds awesome. And I get how it must feel really great. And I get how it must feel like this is the right thing because it feels good. But one of two things actually has to be true here. One, God's word and your understanding of it has to have changed. Or two, 
you don't think that God's actually right. It has to be one of those two things. It can't be anything else. There have been so many times in my life where I've had to have that kind of internal dialogue, sometimes too late, about whether my decisions match God's word or whether they match the culture and the experiences that I'm swimming in. And sometimes, honestly, we don't only need to check the culture that we're living in out there, but we have to check the culture that we're living in in here. Because over the past thousands of years, the church even has had to course correct over and over and over and over again as we as humans have drifted away from the righteousness of God and have had to steer back towards it. The beauty is that God doesn't change. So wherever, wherever you find things that are inconsistent with the righteousness of God you see in scripture, you can trust he's not the one that has to change. The question is always, are we willing to change? Are we willing to change when it's inconvenient? Are we willing to set things aside because the unchanging nature of God is righteous and pure and good? God's righteousness matters because we actually need a God who doesn't change. But God's righteousness also matters because we need a God who's near. I'm going to read the second stanza again. Uh, let's see if I can open it again. Okay, starting in verse 145. I call with all my heart, answer me, Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to, say, to you, save me, and I will keep your statutes. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I've put my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice in accordance with your love. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your laws. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, Lord, and all your commands are true. Long ago, I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. The thing that strikes me about this stanza in the psalm is that it's extremely intimate. We get this really intimate picture of the psalmist's relationship with God. Now, we've seen already through this psalm that this writer has enemies who are opposed to him and his way of life, presumably because he's following God and God's word. And we get the impression of tremendous human isolation. But this stanza isn't just a declaration of how he has enemies or how God's law is the one that he delights in. This stanza is a plea for God just to be with him, just to be with him. The tone here is almost like his enemies have come so close that he can't even escape. The psalmist is desperate for God here. He says, I call out to you with all of my heart. Now that's kind of lost on us in English because we say all of my heart all the time, but really he's saying every fiber of my being is calling out to you. He's saying, God, answer me. God, hear me. God, save me. In verse 50, he says, those who devise wicked schemes are near. And then he goes on and he says, but you are near, O Lord. It's not that the psalmist is disregarding the fact his enemies are close. He knows they're close. It's as if he's looking at the presence of his enemies in light of a greater reality that God himself, the righteous one, is closer. We have very real, very pressing struggles and enemies in our lives. Some of them are internal. Um, for some of us, they take the form of anxiety or depression or experiences that haunt us, that rear their ugly heads in season. And for some of us, we have times when we find ourselves in circumstances we never would have chosen and we can't seem to get out of. We don't know what the enemies of this psalmist actually were, but whatever they were, the intimate picture of him pleading before God and asking God to just show up, that's a pretty familiar picture, isn't it? He knew he had a God who would answer him, a God who would be present, a God who listened and who lent his ear, a God who is full of compassion, a God of love, a God who remembers his promises, and ultimately a God who was bigger than all of his circumstances who nothing is impossible for. We want to know that God. We want to know the God that we can call on is big enough to act on our behalf. We need a God who is so loving he's always near. Now, if God is not righteous, his nearness at best would be like having an invisible friend who would tell you what you wanted to hear. That may keep you from being lonely, but it robs God of the power to change people and circumstances, to guard you and to fight for you. 
If God is not righteous, it doesn't really matter actually if he's near or not because the only love he could give you would not be enough to save you. None of our favorite things about God would be true or valuable if he were not first righteous. Perhaps the psalmist understood something that has taken me a lot longer to see. Because God is righteous, he is worth our complete devotion. Now, this past April, I went to Nashville to this thing called the Q Conference. And the Q Conference is a Christian conference about current events and things happening both like in the United States, but also globally as well that are going to end up impacting the church one way or another. And it's really interesting the types of conversations that end up happening. Now, they have amazing speakers who fly in from everywhere to kind of, you know, the leaders of whatever thought, thoughts are happening in order for the church to basically learn. And one of the women who came and was interviewed uh, worked for World Vision, and she was Rwandan. She was actually in Rwanda during the genocide. And she told her story to a room full of 2,000 Americans about being chased during the genocide, about having her hand chopped off, and about having her eight-month-old baby killed in front of her. Now, when you listen to someone explain the reality of a genocide, you realize how God has to be righteous. He just has to be. Things that are that clearly evil and wrong make us long for the opposite. But that's not the end of her story. After the genocide, as she was helping people rebuild, which is when she got connected to World Vision, she struck up a, a friendship with a man who was working alongside her. And one day he came up to her and said, I have to ask for your forgiveness. I'm the one who cut off your hand and who killed your child. It was me. Will you forgive me? She passed out. She was in the hospital for a week. And in that week, the forgiveness of Jesus washed over her as she prayed and asked God for strength. And when she left, she extended forgiveness to that man, and they work together to this day. Now, there was not a dry eye in the room of the thousands of people, thousands of Americans who were there, and you could have heard a pin drop. And it was then that she looked out at all of us in this strange, delighted, and assured way, almost like she was having a hard time understanding what we were so shocked about. And she said, haven't you read scripture? Don't you understand what Jesus did for you? We are to do the same for others. She knew the path laid in front of her because she knew the righteous and loving God she served. She knew that she could trust his law and his promises because he is righteous. She knew he wouldn't change. She knew he was near. She knew he's righteous. Turns out God's love doesn't balance out his righteousness. God's love and his righteousness are one. The greatness of his love is seen in the fact that a righteous, perfect God came and gave himself up for people like you and like me. People who fail. People who are imperfect. And people who fail over and over and over again and who change is really hard for, even though they change like shifting shadows. People whose intentions we can't trust. People who are capable and do, of and do tremendous amounts of evil. Evil. People who now, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, God looks at and says, Beloved, you too are now righteous. And then once he does that, he asks us to follow him on a path where he will walk with us. A God like that, a God we can trust, one who doesn't change, one who's close, a righteous God like that is worth our total devotion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are righteous and you are perfect and we are not, God. And we just lay our whole selves out in front of you this morning knowing that you are, you are the one that's strong enough to, enough to save us. You are the one who's strong enough to weather storms for us and with us. You are the one who's gonna be our shield and our protector and our strength when we feel weak. 
Lord, we pray this morning that we would confess the things in us that are not of you. I pray, God, that you would arrest our attention back to your word. I pray, Lord, that as we take steps towards you, you would be present and near and that we would feel the love of your, of your spirit, God. Lord, we need you. We need you so much. And we pray that even this morning, we would just get a glimpse of your goodness and your grace, which we don't deserve. We put all of this in the hands of your righteous son, Jesus Christ. Amen.